For some reason, I cannot unmute my mic. Um, I am not sure why I cannot. Let's try this one more time. Oh, you guys can hear me now. <laughs> Sorry, the, the comments are delayed. I had to do a whole workaround. Thank you guys for the patience. I tried to be sophisticated and get a mic set up and y'all, it ain't work out. So y'all just gonna go ahead and listen to me on my um, laptop stuff. But yay, thank you guys for sticking with me. Y'all some real ones. Okay, so as I was yapping away, I was talking about clearly cast about how ex excited I am to talk to you guys about it. And um, pretty much, I, I won't waste too much time. I'll get into kind of like a little intro of it. And then we're going to bring Weekend Reader on to really get into it. Um, but yeah, so Cass, what was your guys' initial thoughts on part one and part two? Like, if you could just drop like a rating in the chat five star was it a four star for y'all was it you know trash i don't know um y'all know this was my second go around so the first time i listened to this via audio and this time i have the physical copy um you know i liked it that much that i purchased it and i was like let me go ahead and go through this will be a nice experience to be able to talk about it but i already read this child <laughs> It didn't matter that I already read this or listened to it. Reading to it in a physical copy form, um, honestly, that was like a whole different experience for me. Um, it kind of was like I was reading it for the first time. And yeah, if I was to go with like what I think um, my first, oh, okay, I see a 4.25. I love it so far. She's speaking the truth. Yes, yes to all of that. Um, I gave it, it's hard. I would say like a four and a half star. Like the first, for the first part one, I think it was a good intro setting the tone kind of, of where we were at. And I was like, okay, even though I read this, remember I already listened to all of this. I was kind of like, oh, okay, I don't really remember um, part one so much. Got into part two. I was like, Lord, what's she trying to do to us? <laughs> like this is a little too much. She might be a little too good at narrative nonfiction because um, something about it where it's like, it's hard, it's like hard topics and it's a lot to digest, but it's the way she does it in a narrative way. I lose myself and I found myself just going through it. So I kind of had to refresh again before the live because I felt like I couldn't put it down when I was in it, even though it's like hard topics, um, so to speak, like, it's heavy, but it's um, palatable in a in a way. And I feel like the way Isabel Wilkerson, um, I don't know if you guys have read The Warmth of Other Suns. That's probably another question. Have you read The Warmth of Other Suns or is this the first um, that you're reading of Isabel Wilkerson? Um, in The Warmth of Other Suns, she pretty much, um, I'm put my hair up. She pretty much, because um, it's just too much going on. She pretty much had nonfiction in the same way, but she told it through storytelling where you kind of get lost in it. And I solely read Cass off of the strength of the warmth of other sons, because um, in American history, as we all know, there's not really a good time to talk about these things. There's not really a happy time where I'm in a great space and I could really take this information and it's not going to impact or affect me. Um, but this year, 2020 has been a little bit even more so I was kind of like, do I want to put myself in that mental space of even reading this right now? And I decided to go ahead because I had already had the hold. And that's kind of what made me want to bring it to the channel as a read along, because what I found was even though it was very heavy topics, I appreciated the book so much. And I actually wanted to reread it in a physical um, format. So I'm hoping so far you guys are having kind of a similar experience. I know these are heavy topics, but hopefully it's done in such a way where the information has been um, palatable and digestible for you guys. Um, so yeah, I will go ahead and see down here. One of the questions I put on there, were you nervous reading Cass? Basically given how bleak everything was, I don't know if anybody else was kind of in that space, but I know I was. Um, another thing while I was reading this, I was kind of just thinking of the things that kind of stood out the most to me. And I don't know if you guys had a moment, but one of the things that stood out the most was actually towards the end, I think of part two, 
when Isabel Wilkerson kind of put a lot of things into perspective where while I'm reading this, some of this stuff is new information, but a lot of it's not new, but the way she frames it and packages it all in one was kind of new to me. One of this, what you see on the screen was actually something that was completely new to me. And that was pretty much the, the quote of no current adult will be alive in the year in which African-Americans as a group will have been free for as long as they had been enslaved. That will not come until the year 2111. And that really had me taken aback a little bit because overall, I feel like America downplays, you know, pretty much the oppression that goes on in the country. But even myself, I don't think I grasp just how long we have been oppressed relatively. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna pause there. Y'all go ahead and start shooting in some of your things to kind of get the conversation going. But I kind of just wanted to give you backstory as to what started this live while we're talking about this and to get a pulse of the audience. Um, but I'm gonna see if Linnell is ready to be added to the stream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to have to do a little work around because like my little um, boot bootleg uh, Rolly, we might just keep 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 my little self over there to the side. And we just know. that. That's, that's <laughs> okay. But yeah, Linnell, thank you so much for joining this live. Yeah, no know, problem. This is a real one here, because when I tell you this was impromptu, it was impromptu. And um, she just rolled with it. But before we get into that. If you could just introduce yourself to the people. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I can see that this um, book discussion is going to be fire because y'all are just going in in the comments. So I love it. But my name is Linnell. Um, I'm the weekend reader on Twitter. I have a blog that I mostly um, review and talk about romance. But 2020, I've been trying to be better about reading nonfiction. Um, and especially um, nonfiction that's specific <clears throat> to the Black experience. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> this past summer I was reading books and I was like, oh, some of these things you definitely need to read with a group because you got to unpack some of this. And so when Jordan was like, you want to come through? And I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> because this is a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm super excited to be here and want to discuss this part one and two. Yeah, so I, I realized, I think once I take myself off, it takes my audio off. But yeah, like that's exactly kind of how I felt. Because I told you, like, I had already technically read this. Um, you know, I listened via audio and that was a whole experience. Robin Miles... You guys can let me know how you guys took this. Was it in audio format? Is it via reading um, on ebook or is it a physical copy? And Robin Miles, I say she does a fantastic job around the way on narrating this. Um, but when I was listening, you know, there was so much that I kind of wanted to talk about with other people. Mm -hmm. Nobody I knew was really reading it, and it was like a lot of um, a lot of information. Some of it triggering, most of it. Yeah. Probably. But it's like, I don't know, it was like framed in such a new way. So how did you feel? Because like some of these things are probably not new to if you're you're black, they're not really new to you. So it's kind of like, why would you decide to, you know, read this? Like, what would be the point in reading this? Um, so, so far, what's been your experience? Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with you that some of the information wasn't new to me, but the way it was um framed was definitely like it gave me some time to think through okay part of the reason why we as a country don't do well talking about racism is that it's lost its meaning and it's too fluid but in the way she is describing caste systems it, it in my opinion is a lot more digestible and you can have a in my opinion more um, nuanced conversation. I think the part that was really jarring for me was the juxtaposition of Nazi and the Indian caste system. So I knew about, you know, both of those things, but framing the way that um, 
the these events dehumanized intentionally and systematically dehumanized people, I thought that was the part that really clicked with me. Yeah, because that's, you know, that's that's an interesting thing because I've actually even listened to some interviews because um, I think any time when we talk about um, race in America or more specifically racism in America, there's like a taboo, of course, where you can't really talk about it. But even if you talk about it, they collectively, there's like this thing where they try to make it where it's not that bad yeah. in comparison. So it's almost like you cannot say any, you know, you can't say anything. Everybody knows what Nazi Germany did was horrendous, yep. disgusting, inhumane, all of that. But if there's any comparison in any relative shape or form of what American history has done, it's like, how dare you? That right. you could never even fix your mouth to compare the two, or even if it's not in comparison, to not frame it as if it was as disgusting as it was. And I'm just like, even with this book coming out, I feel like it, that part was a controversial topic. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys saw that, um, if you're in the comment section, if you guys saw that people were talking about this. Um, I Y'all may or may not know, I'm also into sports and um, one of my favorite sports figure um, kind of commentators is a lady named Jamel Hill. Um, she's black, she's on ESPN, that has a lot to do and she's very vocal. Anyway, she tweeted something about reading this book and just basically how, you know, if you thought that um, America's system was in no way comparable to some of the more horrendous systems in the past, you're crazy or something. And when I tell you that thing got so much backlash, it's mm -hmm. like, why? For why though? I just don't get it. Well, I think she does a really good job towards the end of part two saying that um, because America was founded on the, the premise of taking land from people and enslaving people, it's become so entrenched in the morality clause of the way we do life that if I'm a good person, then I inherently cannot be racist, right? And it's not about your morality, it's about whether or not you can say and agree that slavery and the enslavement of millions of people was horrible and the continued dehumanization of, of a group of people, whether through laws, cultural norming, um, the postcard um, well, reference. Mm. I, I don't think I knew that. I, I mean, I, I, I think I've seen it in like a documentary, but I didn't realize that um, lynching and burning of black bodies and memorializing them through postcards was, was such a thing. So that, I, I think that was like a really good image of it was okay to do it. And so people didn't see that it's wrong. And I think in in our time frame, people think, well, if I'm not murdering or shooting at or doing these really extreme things, then I cannot be racist. But what was really jarring for me and really why I think we struggle with this um, topic is, I didn't realize that the Nazis used America's slavery and segregation policies to inform their strategy. That part was definitely new to me. And even reading that there are certain things that American policies um, did was too far for them was, was strange to read as well. Cause it was just like, we all agree that Nazis are bad people, but they even have a line. It seems strange. Yeah, no, it's it's funny because I, okay, so I don't think I knew the level of it, but um, I went to South Africa, was it a year, almost two years ago now. And anyways, long story short, preparing for that trip, I was trying to figure out more about South Africa. And through that, you know, reading, I had found out like South Africa, they based a lot of their systems on America and used that for examples on how they structure their, you know, the apartheid and all of that and the structure of that. And through that, I also had learned 
that that's what Nazi Germany had did. So I didn't, Isabel Wilkerson goes into even more detail on how they really looked at the laws from a legal standpoint on how can we build this into from a structure standpoint, not just from an emotional standpoint, but really having it fixed into laws where we strip people of their rights and we start dehumanizing individuals um, in a legal way where we just take it away. I was like, wow, when they said it, that one drop thing got, got me too, because I believe it was like, they were like, well, they're going to do instead, if it's three um, Jewish grandparents, yeah. then that's where they'll draw the line. But they're like, we can't go as far as America. They taking a little too far. Too far. <laughs> like really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it, 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 uh, yeah. It's strange because um, I visited Germany um, in 2018 and you don't, they don't shy away from that they were on the wrong side of history. And I think in my mind, that's part of why Americans have such a strong uh, a, a struggle to have this conversation. Because for some people, slavery was just a way to do economics. And it, it isn't, right? Because, you know, the murdering and entrapment and removing people from their land. And it's not just about, um, or it's complicated because it's it's two ways of enslaving and humanizing people, indigenous um, to the land and bringing people to the land. I think that part was like, yeah, until America collectively is able to say slavery is bad and it has some systematic um, legs that have disenfranchised indigenous and um, descendants of Africa, we will not be able to have this conversation um, in a healing manner, in my opinion. No, I completely agree. I, I mean, I think that you can see it across the board. I. I um, I don't want to get too much into the Germany aspect, but that was something that I I didn't really realize. Um, I think from a holistic stance, I understood that you know Germany has done a lot to kind of just acknowledge her past and stuff like that. But um, later in the book, I know she'll dive into that a little bit more. But that's dope that you were even there to see it for yourself, like kind of how it is because mm -hmm. it's. Here is like, you can't talk about it. You're not allowed to talk about it. The only way we're even consuming stuff is through books like this, which. Right. Some people are like, well, that's what books are for is to teach you. Yeah, but also your school and just regular history lessons should be teaching this. It should just be common knowledge. Like, right. and, and I think that's part of maintaining the caste system, right? If you don't know any better and someone is telling you you're rightfully superior to other people, but not using necessarily that language, it's easy to continue in your comfort. I think you have to be uncomfortable in order to acknowledge that racism is awful and people are being impacted daily because of it. Yeah, and it's funny because I'm looking at the comments on here and um, Joanna, I saw you said she gives us the facts. It's not opinion. It's not one person's mm -hmm. experience. It's our indisputable history. It's not about whether we agree or disagree. And that kind of brings back to the point of what you were saying um, early, kind of Linnell, like if you're kind of focused on the feeling about it of this is how I feel and all that. It's not really sticking to the facts. And I think right. um, that chapter where I think it's called the R word, which I thought, I, I thought it was, I, I'm not saying stuff like this is funny, but I thought it was, it was funny. It made me chuckle in the sense of people really treat it like it's the R word. Like you can't say racist. And I'm mm -hmm. like, it's mm -hmm. so funny. So it's like, I get like, from that standpoint, I understood why she was saying that she felt like racism wasn't a broad enough term to describe like what, yeah the system in America is, um, to look at the system as a caste system, that concept to me is completely new. That's not something yeah. that I um, ever considered or think about. I always think of the term in just racism. And I get that caste, our caste system is based off of this social construct of race, whatever, however you want to feel about it. Um, but even for me, it made me kind of digest it kind of in a different way. A different way back to that whole um i guess point but how did you feel like how do you feel about her i guess decision of kind of focusing on cast and taking that feeling off of it um and not really exploring racism so much as casteism yeah so i definitely think 
um, there's room for criticism in that because while we might intellectually know that race is a social construct, we can't separate ourselves from it, right? Like how I identify is like very clear. I'm a black woman. Now, you might not know my ethnicity, you might not know my cultural background, but you make some assumptions about me when you see me based on my perceived race. So I think like I need to read more in the book to really um, suspend my belief so much because like I said, I, I, I understand that race is a social construct, but I think y- using caste, right? It is structural. And because people think racism is person to person, per se, um, I think I get the rationale and reason to use caste because it makes more sense. It's it's structural. It has legs um, that whether you believe into it or not, like she is making the case that structurally you have in this environment in a caste system there needs to be inherently a bottom and black people are the bottom yeah yeah it's funny cuz even as, like even throughout this i struggle with that um aspect of it because i feel like you know she does have a quote in there where she says and it was in i think part 1 or part 2 where she says like you know it's not mutually like it's not meaning like it, it talking about casteism removes racism so much but right. it's so like shifting the focus. And then part of me, it's like, I had an internal struggle. Like part of me is like, yes, that's true. We can frame it, but some of the stuff is also just racist. Like, in the sense, right. like maybe that's just a term I'm just most used to using, but I'm like, some, like some of these people know damn well, it's based off of race. Like right. that's what it's based off point blank period. <laughs> I think she tries to um, make the case where there's, she tries to show you the difference between racism and casteism. But yeah. in the way I was reading it, I was like, I don't see the difference. It, it is the different side of the same coin almost, right? Because yeah. in order to have the caste system, you have to have racism, right? Like, you know, now I, I think there was a point where she was talking about, you know, caste, keeps people from moving forward and doing certain things and racism, you might be racist because you find comfort in that. And I was like, but then aren't they the same thing in that example? But I want to be careful not to do too much judgment because I only read part one and part two. And what I feel like she's doing is laying the groundwork. So she puts down one brick, she, you know, describes it, kind of transitions you into the next brick, but then points back to the brick before. So my assumption is each part will build on the previous part. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait. It's, it's a four star read for me right now, because mm-hmm. I think some of the stuff is a little repetitive. Um, and I, and I, there's a part of me, I don't know if it's the radical part of me. I feel like she's not going far enough. But, <laughs> but I want to be careful to say I that, know. right? Because I haven't read the whole book. Yeah. And, you know, and also I'd be feeling like I want to be careful about that because I feel like I'm pretty radical or speak a lot and say all this stuff. But at the end of the day, you are also trying to publish a book. And I will say this is probably very, very direct given the circumstances. But a lot of this she gives. And I guess that's part of when you're sticking to the facts in a sense this nonfiction. But she gives a lot of um, benefit of the doubt on the motives Mm -hmm. of the people behind the racism and part of me like, bruh. You guess no, you guess no benefit of that doubt for me. But I understand why she did it. But I felt like that too, but not in the sense where I dinged it, more so in the sense of like, oh my gosh, how many passes can we give? Yeah. yeah. So understanding. I don't want to be understanding. Yeah, I feel like it's that argument people make, well, I can't be racist because I date or I have a kid or so and so is in my family. Yeah, you can be. <laughs> um yeah. because if you are saying that your kid can't have certain experiences or the only reason your kid should have these experiences is because their association to your whiteness, you there's some things that you need to 
on do. But I also was thinking, and maybe you can help me since you've read the book, I felt that same way about how to be anti-racist. Like we keep trying to, you know, shuffle around the word, right? Because people have been using it willy-nilly, but we still don't want to necessarily attack. If you do these things, then you are this thing, right? There's no getting around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I I mean, it's an internal struggle. And I'm looking at the chat. I'm seeing a lot of people are like, um, Arva said, I think she does it to reach a lot of audience. And Gabrielle was like, she's way more understanding than I thought was possible. <laughs> um, you know. Probably because of her journalism background, right? Like she yeah. has to be impartial in the way she presents the information. And the other thing, um, I can't remember who posted it because there's a simultaneous uh, read along with another group. And I was reading their comments um, because sometimes I like to read the comments, prep myself for, (laughs) you know, what I might be feeling. Um, And someone said that they didn't feel like there was any closure. And I I mean, I'm I'm guessing the way it's written is a case study, right? A case study on caste systems. And so you just present the information. There's not any resolution. And I don't I don't know if it's up to her to come up with a resolution or for us to agree that it's a thing um, and then collectively come up with um, a solution. I think I saw someone post that... Um, and uh, race, well, I probably racism probably doesn't need cast it, but or the other way around. And I and I I feel that um I think the I think the comment is cast doesn't need racism or racism doesn't need cast. Yeah, just put it on there. It's like cast does not need race, race needs cast. Yeah. So and I think to uh to Gabrielle's point, I think that's the point that um Wilkerson is making that racism is the the legs of caste, but caste will be the skeleton or she yeah, she uses the term, some metaphor like that. She says like caste is the skeleton, race is literally the skin. So it's yeah. like in order to get to the foundation, which I actually thought, you know, I guess I'm jumping a little bit, but I actually thought some of the titles I'm like one of those people, like, I like titles a lot. And I thought the mm-hmm. titles were kind of clever. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, container one was, I, I put down the bo- book when I read, um, people are okay with you if you stay inside the container. But yeah. once you start to go, I'm like, oh, that is a really, that's really good imagery. Um, because it's true. I think, you know, if you're too loud, right? That's a way for people to say, get back in your place. Or if you don't wear your hair a certain way, or you don't dress a certain way, it's the containers. Similarly with the, um, the theater, um, description, like have to play these roles. And if you don't play that that role, yeah. Yeah. So she's definitely clever. She is. Cause even with the top I put on the screen, part one toxins in, uh, in the permafrost, permafrost, Mm. And heart rising all around us. Even with that, like when she goes into the scientific breakdown of how things can just boil from underneath and, you know, they're still there and stuff like that. I think she drawed a lot of the um, comparisons and kind of the distinctions between caste and race. And then, I don't know, I just felt like she did a really good job. I wanted to get to somebody's comment here because um, C- Cerulean, you said, I appreciate the non-radical approach because it lures in folks that don't acknowledge racism without the feeling, without them feeling personally attacked. And, you know, I, I teeter on that sometimes, but then I'm part of me in my head because I'm like, it's 2020. I, I I agree. I think it's a good approach for the book, but I guess in my head, I'm like, I'm done giving those to make you feel comfortable and tiptoe so you could, you know, damn well, what's going on. That's how <laughs> I'm feeling. And I don't know if I'm just jaded now and my little innocence is gone and I just have lost my patience because I used to give people all the patience. And it's just slowly trickled away from me. And I'm like, I don't care if you feel personally attacked. I feel personally attacked almost every day. So I'm not trying to make you feel that way, but you kind of have to, you have to embrace it. But sir, I'm not, I'm saying all this and I, I feel you on that comment. I get exactly what you mean when you're saying that. I guess it's like 
my inner conscience has a hard time when we have to make things digestible. But um, then again, on part two, she hits you with straight facts when she's talking about mm-hmm. again, the postcards, the burnings, the brutality, stuff that the I- The tree have- in the middle of the road. Oh, that one really, oh, that was too much for me. It's way too much. I wanted to go back. I forget who wrote it. It was a comment that I was looking at. And someone was asking me, like, did I feel like the narration was almost like too calm um, when I was listening to the audiobook? And, you know, I didn't think that when I was listening to it. But I will tell you, when I got the part two of Cats and I was reading this, I was like, maybe the narration didn't exactly depict it as strong, which I think was good for me because at that time I probably wasn't in the mental space for it. Yeah. But reading it physically and having y'all can see my little my little thing. I got all these tabs and all this highlight and all this stuff. <laughs> it's like a mess. I was like, when you're like reading mm-hmm. word for word, it's like it literally comes almost it's in your face. Mm-hmm. She describes it. That's why I say she's too good at narrative nonfiction. She describes it in a way that made me view every instant, kind of see just how disgusting and grotesque it was just laid out for me. So I kind of feel like I don't think it's the narrator that's too calm. I just think when you're reading stuff like this, there it it's just gonna feel harsher, I think, if you're actually physically reading the words. That's just my opinion. I don't know, you know, how yeah, I um I got the audiobook just um, cause I was worried that there would be parts that would be too much, um, to like physically read. Um, and whenever I'm doing audiobooks, I like to take no- notes at the same time. Um, so I read the first part, um, and I just took notes. Um, so it made me stop and kind of digest versus, you know, having the audiobook on and writing. But I think, um, I think part of the conversation is trying to find pathways for us to have these conversations. Um, and in some ways there needs to be like an intro or entry point. And I think the only way to do that is to not have people feel attacked. So I definitely understand where they're coming from. But in order to move on, I think it's going to be really important that people understand part of the journey is being uncomfortable. Because just because she's talking about it in um, in the terms of that binary of whiteness and of color, so whether you're brown, red, yellow, black, I think there's some things that you, as a black person, you still have to unpack because there was a part where she was talking about a talk that she was giving and an African woman said, um, there's no black people in Africa. They only become black until they come to America. And I was like, what, it, what is, I, I don't get that. And then, uh, you know, a few uh, sentences later, she explains it. And I think as a black person too, like there are things that I have to learn and undo based on historical information that I didn't have access to. So, you know, it's like deprogramming. Why do you think the way you think? Yeah. And, and it's I wrong. On the screen, that quote, Cause that was another one where it's interesting. Cause later, I think later in the book, um, she talks about when she talks about black people out like across the diaspora, um, there are certain elements where not right now, but it, 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 it does, I, I'm, I'm excited for when we all can kind of digest. Cause there were certain things I just kind of wanted to unpack with others, but yeah, like when she said that I get exactly what that quote means, like in Af- Africans, we are not black and stuff like that. We are, you know, Igbo, we're Yoruba. I get that. And I do understand that. And that is a different concept that I think probably is particular to that person. And I also kind of felt like that was probably particular to the logic of just what it is. But I do think when you come, maybe they do it to tour for tourists. When you go to Africa, like they really are like, oh, you're coming back home. You're black. Like they do it in a way where you feel welcome. Like we're all whatever. And Ghana, the year of the return and all that stuff. I feel like there is a collective understanding of, because I mean, colonization and stuff happened in those countries as well. But I think there's a collective understanding of, yes, this new social construct that wasn't really real and was arbitrary and man-made, now we're living in it. And that has kind of forced us to um, 
take on this. Um, but it was interesting because somebody else also said, um, I wanted to go back. I know I put it on the screen, screen, but it was just basically like they felt like even for them as a black person, yeah, this was, okay, got it. In a weird way, her factual, non-opinionated, non-radical approach even helped me as a black woman because yeah. I was able to stop myself from just sitting in my feelings and learn new things. And you know, I actually, I can concur with that. I can concur. I think that's why, even though this was a not a rough time, every time's rough, like I say all the time, but a, probably a harder time for me to read it because it was so factual while still being uh, narrate like narrative in the sense of easy reading in a way. Um, the facts made me be able not to disassociate. I don't know what the right word is, but to kind of like what you said to not sit so much in my feelings and to kind of just take in, um, take in the information. And I think yeah. that point is really good too, because like sometimes and I don't want to speak for all black people or even all black women. I think sometimes we don't have the language to explain what we're feeling. Right. And so when we read how much we've been separated from our history, whether the gruesome part or even the connections back to Africa, it helps give context to why you're angry. It helps give context to why you want to have a certain life for you and your family. And I think, you know, part of our journey will be on learning, you know, revisionist history. Um, and by doing that helps us to, to arm ourselves to have, you know, nuanced conversations with our friends or our family or loved ones, because within the black community, it's not a monolith, right? Like yeah. you live up, well, it, is DC considered the South? I feel like it, it depends on who you Bruh. talk to. <laughs> yeah. And it's also Virginia, like, you know, a lot of the stuff, even, you know, from 1619, when we go back to that, which is discussed in the book, Virginia is considered the South and Virginia, the DMV area in that DC metro area that Virginia's there. And you know, that, that long story short, DC is not considered the South, Virginia is, even though it's yeah. right next door. And I think people pick and choose. And the yeah. book does a good job of talking about how, um, why, the, like, why the South or Southern states are seen or deemed as kind of more racist in a sense, because there were just more black people that were there, people who were classified as black because there were more enslaved people there. So the laws and the treatments you would see it, technically probably, it was more, strict there. I forget the way she frames it because they're just more black people. So I thought by her saying that, I don't know if people are able to unpack pack lay layers, people of the upper class, if cast, if we want to say so, but it's pointing out that America as a whole had these laws built in place. The North wasn't right. just this place that was not racist or did not practice in the caste system. It just so happens that the Southern states were the states with the that were really had the most black people there? So of course yeah. it was that way. Um, which is but, yeah. But go ahead, yeah. Um, uh, what I was going to say is that um, she does still touch on that um, brutal things still happen to black people in the north. We just like to have that division, you know. Well, you know, the South wanted to maintain slavery, but she talks about there were shopkeepers that still wanted to have black people stay in their place. So they still did horrible mm -hmm. things to keep people in their place, keep black people in their place. Yeah. So the and one thing that I thought was interesting is that she references indigenous people. Um, and I think she kind of talks about the, um, the boarding schools, but she doesn't talk about, um, how those two things happening simultaneously um, help maintain wealth for people that were coming in. And I just wish that um, there's a text that talks about how Jim Crow segregation, slavery, and um, the disenfranchisement of indigenous people, they were happening simultaneously and it in, encouraged white Europeans to maintain wealth and to move themselves up 
the caste system. And I have not read a book yet that talks about those two experiences because they're happening simultaneously. Yeah, and I think she gets into it a little bit more, a little bit later, not completely okay. in depth, not super in depth, um, okay. but it's enough, I think, where it touches on kind of how the caste system kind of supports the the need to rem kind of protect whiteness and how the definitions uh -huh. of whiteness keep changing because of yeah, the yeah, different yeah. people that are coming in. So she does get into that later. A little bit later, um, I forget what parts, but um, yeah, I think there's a line where she she says that you know in your your home country you could have been at war with these people, but as soon as you came over, you are now white and you forgot that, and a part of your um, socialization was taking on this white identity. And I was like, yeah. That makes so much sense because, you know, when you go somewhere else, people are like, I'm not white. I'm, you know, I'm a Spaniard. I'm like, well, you know, yeah. you're white <laughs> in America. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, yeah. It's interesting because I think that's one thing that I don't under, even for me, I have a hard time grasping how the rest of the world views race. Mm -hmm kind of like in some countries like with traveling i recognize that they definitely see me as black <laughs> mm -hmm. in other countries sometimes they see you as um they may see you as black but they probably see you as american and money so i don't really know what it's like for other black yeah. people who are living in that um country because i feel like the world has a like the not every aspect of the world but western society you know what they did with um native people black people um that has impacted a lot of yeah. a lot of countries. So yeah. it's weird. Yeah, I think you and know, and I struggle wondering. with um, <laughs> when I um, people talk about um, their expat experience, like going to another country, and it's so much better. They're not dealing with racism. It's I don't I don't know if well. Let me not try to invalidate someone's experience. I think part of that is other countries see you as American first and then fill in the blank with being black because I had this really interesting experience when I was in Madrid a few years ago. They were treating Africans poorly yeah. at the train station, like ignoring them and telling them to go, you know, in my limited Spanish, go back to where they came from. But then in the same breath, someone could treat me different because they found out that I, well, I had my American passport, right? And so I think in a lot of ways, the Americanness, right, is what they see or identify with first rather yeah. than Blackness, which is strange, right? Because, you know, it's not like they're not Black people all over the country, over the world, but there's something about being American in Europe is different. Now, sometimes they're like Americans are cocky and ignorant and all of those other things. But I'm in my experience, because I'm not African, I'm Black American, I'm treated differently in a little bit, you know, I don't know if it's better because I, I've, I only had that one experience, but... Yeah. Is definitely different. But the one place that I think is really, really interesting is um, Central and South America, because I always think of them as, for a lack of a better word, white passing. But when you go to South and Central America, I mean, I have, I've only been towards the tip of South America. There are so many more Black people or you know, darker skinned people in these countries that I often don't see in imagery. Um, and I just think like, again, isn't that racism at work, right? Because when you think of Colombia or Costa Rica or Belize or any of those other countries, I, I, I think of like blonde hair, blue eye or green eye, and there are more people who look like us walking around on the streets. Yeah, and it's interesting because in the book, when she talks about that um, a little bit, she talks about basically like the arbitrary how with race is ridiculous, how you could have someone who's technically whiter than people who are considered white, but because they're from Asia, they're not yeah. white. 
or if you have some people who have darker skin than like really, really dark skin, they wouldn't be considered black because maybe their hair um, texture is straight. So if you have like someone who's Indian, who's um, brown, that's completely different or somebody, mm -hmm. anyone from Southeast Asia, essentially like, it, it's it's like not real, like, and it shifts. And then you have like light skinned black people. Then you have yeah. the brown people. Then you have yeah. her. And it's like all, it's all made up. <laughs> like all of it, right. made up, but we just have to deal with it because they have lumped in, you know, facial features, uh, your nose, your thing. And that's how you get into passing and people who can pass and cannot. And um, one of the quotes that she says in there, which was funny, was just basically, um, it wasn't this one. This was the one when I found that's closest to it, but it was just basically like how genius it was um, when Nazi Germany was looking at the legal standpoint, they thought it was genius on how confusing the situation was where you can't really easily, like you could just basically make up whatever you want, pure fiction, and then put that as a rule. It's like the shape shifting, I think she calls it caste system in America that's based off of a race is just really, it's, it's, it's a number, it's a number. Um, I did want to talk about, because, you know, we're talking about um, the book and some of the narrative pieces throughout the book are some of the pieces where I think it helps me to kind of take a step back. And even though it's probably a, still harsh, it's storytelling. Um, when she talks about the myths, um, the story oh, of the myths, yeah. I was like, one, <laughs> that, I was engaged in, in the story a lot, but I was just like, that that's something. For those of you who haven't read the book, there's a section where... Um, she talks about this girl who grew up and her parents or her father wanted to name her Miss to ensure that white people called her Miss because at that point in time, you know, Jim Crow South, ain't nobody calling no black person Miss. Even nowadays, they be saying boy and they be saying slick stuff. When I say they, I mean some people. They they do certain things. I, I hear sweetie, I've been called sweetie at work and just yeah. little friends sometimes from Southern. A lot of, I don't want to say Southern men, but because it's not always Southern, but I'm digressing. <laughs> so she had a situation where she was in school and the, the principal, principal yeah didn't want to say her name was like no what is your real name and could not say yeah. miss to save his life and i'm like is it gonna kill you yeah like, and i liken that to like when people screw up our names like they would rather call us something else than what our names are right and um and i think it was ingenious for her father to want to make sure that she has that dignity even though like i feel black people always say miss something especially if you grew up in the south like i'm I migrated here and that was like the first lesson that i had to learn <clears throat> you call people miss something you just don't call them their yeah. first name because that's too familiar so i thought it was ingenious and i was like good for him to make sure that his daughter had humanity but yeah. she you know they they still found a way yeah to make sure that she knew where her place was yep it's always always trying to that checks and that balances and i saw mm -hmm. like everywhere you said the principal was mad mad big mad um <laughs> which honestly that's revolutionary itself in itself because that's like a it's kind of scary. It's sad, like just naming your child Miss is almost like scary to do. And I think it was yeah. Texas they were living or wherever because of the like the that was unnecessary tension that girl had to go through. But yeah. um, especially, I think there was a part where he was like, "You're not from here because you're looking me in the eye." And yeah. I was just, I can't imagine that power dynamic of of a little girl trying to, you know, follow the instructions from her family. Cause she, I think she said like, you know, my daddy told me to answer this way. So she was answering questions and she's still being emotionally threatened by someone who is supposed to be, you know, protecting her in this environment. But he was, you know, trying to dehumanize her in this sense. So, yeah, I, I, I think about because um, I read Push Out over the summer and that's another book, I think, um, that really talks about how the school system is still set up to displace and throw away um, black kids because they're not taking into consideration racism and structural things like poverty and violence. Um, home and food insecurity, how it's impacting how kids are showing up in 
classrooms and teachers are just re-victimizing them in another way. So that that particular passage made me think about that book too. Yeah, and I've seen some other people in there, um, the comments um, section. Arva, you said you found humor in that. It was very common for people to name their, the sons Sir John just to make sure um, they to show them respect. And you know, I, I guess I didn't I didn't realize that. That's probably that's a blind spot for me. Like I didn't really know the the history be behind that because I do know of sirs and stuff like that, and I mm -hmm. never. Really I never correlated one to the other, which is it's just so crazy. And somebody else said that they had a first cousin whose name was Queen, which I I, I, love, it. I love I love that too. And um, oh yeah, and I guess uh, on here was um, something that would irritate me was when someone would call my mom and refer to her by her first name, and I would make them address her as Mrs. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like things like that. It's you know, there's so many. There's so many triggering things <laughs> that just happen with the way people address y you or you see them address yeah. your parents. Like growing up, I had so many instances where I knew people were specifically um, pretty much taking out the respect for my parents or stuff. And then also if you come from another country and you have an accent, there are certain yeah. things that go with that. And it's like, and I'm like, bro, you're not going to do, you know, you like six, seven years old. You're like, bro, you're not going to do this. <laughs> right. Put some respect on there, but you don't really understand why. Um, and I'm trying to get through some of these comments to make sure we're looking at some of these. Reminds me, oh, yes, reminds me of Austin Shannon Brown's I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World oh, Made for Whiteness. Another one. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. And that's a short read. So you could probably read it over a weekend and be mad, but then still, you know. <laughs> talk and unpack with your families. But I think with that one is really, really good. And I think um, Isabel does a, a, a good job of it too, of how Christianity is weaponized to also dehumanize people. And so in the Austin Channing case, I always feel like I mess up her last name. Um, in that book, she talks really about how, you know, um, Christian spaces replicate really racist behavior so yeah a good one too we should um write uh post all of the book recommendations that people are shouting out yeah on there and it's funny because the austin shannon brown um on that one i thought that was um interesting that was a really short read but i thought it was also interesting on how strategic throughout the history we have had to be in naming like one, mm -hmm. you know, they pick that name because it could be mistaken for a white man or a white yeah, boy yeah, or yeah. something that you have to be strategic in the way that you name, which is crazy. And uh, my grandpa required everyone to call him sir. He's a black Dominican. Okay, <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. yeah, and I don't see any of the other, um, I think you said you saw some other book recommendations. I don't really see them here. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, I don't think I missed it. But yeah, it's it's interesting because that story and then also the story of when Isabel was talking about her experience when she's going to interview. Mm -hmm. She's from the New York Times. She's going there to actually do an interview. This is going to be big for this business owner. But because that person can't get out their head, the caste system that they we are living under, that this would be the important person that's interviewing, he missed his shot. And it's like how many times you walk into a room, maybe they end up recovering, but people don't assume that you're in yeah. whatever position or place that you're supposed to be. Like, yeah, it's so funny because um, when I went to um, sign the papers for my house, um, the loan processor was talking to my realtor who is she she presents white. Um, but I think she identifies it as Hispanic. Um, and so she was talking about like, oh, um, she brought me in. We were sitting down chatting and she's like, are we going to wait for your husband? And I was like, uh, no. And she's like, wait, this is your, you're doing this all by yourself. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and it made me think of that experience because she stopped what she was doing. And I was like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure women are buying homes by themselves all the time. And this was in 2016. So it was, 
it made me think about like how sometimes we hold on to these like really ingrained, incorrect images about who should be in what spaces and when. Um, and so it's it, good for him. He learned a lesson because <laughs> he didn't get the free pro promo um, like the other, um, or really good for her and bad for him, but. Yeah, because I would like that. And I see that Lady Jay Walker, you said, I love that she didn't even name his store in her book. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No promo. We're not doing none of that. I don't know who you are. And honestly, naming it, I thought she did a good, um, kind of made a good case of naming those one particular one-offs. While that's cool and all, it's bigger than those one-offs. It's literally the entire system that perpetuates this on a repeated basis. And it's like, even if you go to on a flight, I've had people on flights, they look at you, they're in line and they're, they want to check this. They, this is arbitrary, but they want to check your ticket. I'm like, bro, you behind me. And two, you not even, you don't even work here. No, you're not yeah. checking my ticket. What, yeah. what did you think say? Where, where, bro, do you work here? And can you back up? It's like those yeah. types of little things that people do to put you in your place or because they think of you as supposed to being in a certain place. Sometimes it's inconvenience, like mental stressors like that. But then sometimes it literally costs people their lives. Like when you look at Trayvon Martin or different kids or something where people can justify saying, well, he should have just answered to this complete stranger yeah. versus realizing mm -hmm. the victim is the person who was unjustly followed, unjustly targeted, unjustly, all that stuff. It's almost like the system still perpetuates the need of understanding why there should be some fear or double checking that needs to happen when you are black. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good. Ex yeah. 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 yeah and okay. I think people just don't think it exists anymore. And I mean, we have a gentler word for that with microaggressions, but you're right. Like if someone's like being super assertive and aggressive with you to, you know, find about like, if you belong here, that creates like anxiety for you and you can't even enjoy what you were intending to do because this person is like, you don't belong here. And, and then it's like, but you don't even live here or you don't even work here. So why are you even talking to me right now? So like, yeah, why I get are you it. Talking of it? So, uh, Gabriel, you said, or uh, Gabrielle, you said when they ask for your ID when you're outside of your own office, for real, for real. Um, I get some of you guys have met, maybe have read Just Mercy by 